Faculty and Students Take on Discrimination in the ROTC, as told by Joe Elder and Jim Stakely. The place I connected on campus was hearing about the ROTC unit and the fact that it was now under fire because it was used to admit gays and lesbians. And as soon as I found out that it was, they did discriminate on the ground, I thought this is, in a sense, too hypocritical. Because we have a state that doesn't discriminate, we have a city that doesn't discriminate, we have a campus that doesn't discriminate, and then we have these three federally funded organizations with all the stature and reputation they have who do. Two students at UW-Milwaukee, um, Eric Jernberg and Leon Rouse, asked their school to adhere to the spirit of the new law by suspending participation in the ROTC program if that program continued to violate the terms of the statute, and they got the Milwaukee Faculty Senate to consider a motion, but it was not passed. We um, created an organization called UW Faculty Against Discrimination in University Programs. There was, uh, the main person who was behind all of this was, of course, the undergraduate student, Rick Villasenor, and um, Joe Elder in the sociology department, um, was uh, heading that up. It was extremely useful because, uh, you know, because of his Quaker background, he, um, you know, he'd always had a kind of a pronounced position on the military and also had this kind of social activism that comes from his background and also from the church background and everything. So he was a highly respected uh, professor here on campus, well-known, uh, who was a perfect person to head up our UW faculty against discrimination. And so we started off by um, uh, getting a petition. We, had to, um, we looked at the UW rules, and Rick Villasenor looked at the rules, uh, and found out that it's possible to call a meeting of the faculty to deliberate on an issue by getting the signatures of Oh, don't hold me to this. I'd have to read the old newspaper clippings in the Cardinal on this. You know, 10% of the faculty, you have to get 10 or something like that. You know, a certain percentage of the faculty has to sign a petition to do that. So we drafted this petition and then took it around and networked as best we could through our, you know, gay symposium group and in the different departments and everything and got together all of the needed signatures. So beginning in, in the, essentially the spring of 89, we got together the necessary votes, and the decision was that there would be an all-faculty meeting the next fall, which was indeed held on December 4th, 1989, uh, and the vote had to do with whether the faculty would request the Board of Regents to terminate the university contract with the Army and the Air Force ROTC programs if those programs did not end discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation by May of 1993. On December 4th, 1989, we had the first meeting of the full faculty since the Vietnam War era, you know, and it took place at the Stock Pavilion right over there. And that's a building I hadn't been in up to that time, you know, but it was, we needed a big space to pull all those people together. And it was, oh, it was, wow, you know, it was like amazing because, you know, you had your ROTC supporters who wanted to keep the gay people out, people in uniform like crazy speaking, and the officers from ROTC and the university lawyers, and then they got this student group represented by uh, David, uh, well anyway, our, our campus group, the 10% Society, you know, they want to have one student representative speak, the president of that. So uh, all of these presenters, all of these speakers, and wow, it's historical, you know, you can look it up online, by a vote of 386 to 248. Uh, the meeting of the faculty asked the Board of Regents to dismantle its contracts with ROTC. And at a meeting of the Board of Regents in February 1990, Donna Shalala, who was then our Chancellor, and the System President, Kenneth Shaw, recommended the University keep ROTC on campus. And the Regents voted to do that, 13 to 3. But they agreed to lobby the Wisconsin Congressional Delegation to demand that the policy be changed at the federal level. And the university actually appointed a task force with other colleagues and universities to put pressure in Washington to change the policy. Chapter 9, Madison starts the movement. Well, you know, we made national news with that. And uh, also these, um, you know, petitions and uh, 
demonstrations and so on. It was getting to be on the national news, and the UW Madison was kind of le uh, the first one out of the uh, uh, out of the gate on on this thing. But it spread in a sort of wildfire fashion to certain other campuses where there were similar protests going on, including at Harvard, so that it's now being discussed apropos of this nominee uh, Kagan for the Supreme Court, who had, took a position on that. Our committee with uh, Joe Elder as chair also met with Cong Wisconsin Congressman Les Aspen. Students on campus were so upset at the region's decision that they continued to try and force the issue. And in April of 1990, they occupied Bascom for five days, demanding that the chancellor and the system president sign a disclaimer to be put on all university orientation materials, noting the contradiction between U.S. system policy, state law, and the ROTC policy. Um, and after four days with little positive response from the administration, they decided to ramp up their uh, message, and they also occupied the Board of Regents room at the, at the top of Van Heys, on the 18th floor of Van Heys. Well, that was the final straw <laughs> for campus administration, and they uh, broke up the Van Heys sit-in after 10 hours, and the police came in, and they arrested 40 students while a crowd of 300 chanted outside of Van Heys while these students were taken away. It was national news, and the, act, the student activism that followed was national news. And what this, it created, it touched off an explosion of media coverage, and it created subsequent activism on other campuses around the country throughout 1990. Now we've arrived at the 1992 presidential election. For the first time, candidates have to take a stand on the issue of gays in the military. George Herbert Walker Bush supported current policies, and Clinton said that one of the first things he would do in office is sign an executive order overturning the policy. Both Shalala and Aspen left Wisconsin in 93 to join the Clinton cabinet and she was the Secretary of Health and Human Services and he was the Secretary of Defense and so Aspen was the person who basically worked out together with Clinton the don't ask don't tell policy so this is also forged out of this um, you know it was a kind of a concession to the grassroots movement about uh, the status of gays in the middle. Clinton's campaign promise never comes to full fruition with Don't Ask, Don't Tell being touted as a compromise. After 20-something years of activism, the policy is finally overturned on September 20th, 2011.